been given the task of covering a book. Uh, a book which covers about 75, no, about 80 years of Russian history. And this is uh, not a small task. So, by necessity, I will have to be a bit sketchy over some periods. I will try to put my emphasis on the counter-revolution and Stalinist reaction of the 1920s and 1930s and uh, on the uh, restoration of capitalism in the 1980s to 90s. The Russian Revolution was the greatest event in human history. For the first time, the oppressed masses were capable not just of taking power, but also of holding on to it. Uh, the masses of Russia overthrew the Tsarist regime. which was the most reactionary and counter-revolutionary regime in the whole of uh, Europe. The regime had a semi-feudal character, basing itself on the landowning aristocracy, who owned vast, industrial, uh, vast agricultural estates, exploiting an impoverished peasantry who worked with very rudimentary tools and on the other hand you had the beginnings of capitalist development in the cities Uh, particularly around the armaments industry uh, and heavy industry like iron and steel. The whole aim of which was to produce um, uh, uh, a military apparatus. Because of the weakness of the Tsarist regime <coughs> in military matters, which had been exposed in a whole range of wars in the 19th century. So you had a massive growth in the late 19th century, early 20th century. With several million workers moving from the countryside into the factories. So you had a new, uh, fresh working class that was built up. And the regime came in increasing contradiction to the material base in society. <laughs> the rottenness was fully exposed during World War I. <laughs> when the uh, Tsarist officers sent uh, tens of millions of peasants uh, to die in the war against Germany. And they could only produce rifles to arm half of them. So the, the peasants were ordered to advance on the front and when one of her fallen comrades would die, one of her comrades fell, 
They're ordered to pick up people's rifle and continue running. So the masses were trying to find a way out of this uh, situation. <coughs> there were huge shortages, particularly in food. Because the, the decrepit railway infrastructure was uh, completely uh, utilized for the war effort. The first bread riots occurred in 1916, where women workers standing in bread queues and there was no bread. Then finally the situation exploded in February. But the problem of the uh, Russian Revolution, from a schematic point of view, was that the democratic revolution had not taken place. There, ha there have been some land reforms, but they have been completely uh, tied the peasants to the land. And even increase the rate of exploitation of the peasantry. But the bourgeoisie, who would be the ones to carry out the task of democratic revolution, they were completely tied to the landed aristocracy. They even married the aristocratic um, women. And they feared the working class more than they feared the uh, ruling class. <coughs> this became obvious already in 1905. Uh, when the workers were the ones who led the revolution. Although it failed. Uh, it became clear that the role of the de uh, carrying out democratic tasks fell to the proletariat. But it could only do so by seizing power. So this would mean that the proletariat come to power in the backward country. Not as Marx had originally imagined in the, the advanced capitalist countries. <coughs> and it wasn't even it wasn't the perspective of Lenin and Trotsky that the proletariat could come to power and then build socialism on the basis of Russia alone. Uh, the productive forces were not nearly as advanced enough for this. Although there were islands of very advanced uh, production in the big cities. <coughs> so the dispute that they had with the Mensheviks in this period was not uh, over this question. The problem was that the Mensheviks they conceived of Russia in isolation. They thought of the uh, socialist revolution being carried out in the same way that the bourgeois revolution was. That 
place a national revolution where the new ruling class could seize power in one country alone. Um, and so their view was a schematic view. The view of stages where the proletariat could only come to power after capitalism had been uh, firmly uh, established. In Russia itself. But um, the reality was that on a world scale, uh, the conditions had been prepared for uh, socialism. <coughs> Imperialism made it impossible for the bourgeoisie to actually carry out the revolution in all these countries. The world market was penetrating everywhere. And was preventing the indigenous development of capitalism in Russia. And as I said, the bourgeoisie that uh, arose became tied to the aristocracy. Uh, John Reed, in his book, he interviews a number of the big bourgeoisie. One of them uh, says this. Revolution is a sickness. Sooner or later, the foreign powers must intervene. As one would cure a sick child and teach it how to walk. Starvation and defeat may br bring the Russian people to their senses. And this was fairly typical of the way that the bourgeoisie in Russia felt at the time. Um, so the, idea, the conception that uh, Lenin and Trotsky had was that the revolution would be carried out beginning in Russia. It would break at its weak, capitalism would break at its weakest link. But that this would be the first shot of the world revolution. Starting in Russia, moving on to Germany, France, and then to Britain. And it wasn't a utopian dream. Uh, Lloyd George, who was British Prime Minister at the time, it's probably, probably one of the late last of the great British Prime Ministers. Capable of understanding uh, uh, a class society from their point of view. <laughs> and in a secret memorandum, uh, during the negotiations for the Treaty of Versailles, he wrote the following. The whole of Europe is filled with the spirit of revolution. The whole existing order in its political, social and economic aspects is questioned by the masses of the population. So the Russian Revolution was really part of a much wider phenomenon. Only one year later you had a revolution in Germany. We also had massive, gen massive strikes in Britain and in France. 
You have mutinies of troops. You have the revolution in Hungary. And you have the uh, revolution in Italy. In 1919. <coughs> and that's why the first, one of the first tasks of the new, uh, of the communist, of the Bolsheviks was to set up the Communist International. But uh, it, uh, the European Revolution didn't happen. The first wave was defeated. The uh, uh, Hungary, Germany, Italy were all, uh, uh, the revolutions were all reached temporary uh, defeats in the first couple of years. And the imperialists were capable of regaining some semblance of control. In all these countries, the lacking factor was the leadership. No other European country had a Bolshevik party. All the other parties were formed, well, most of them were formed as splits from the Second International. And very little preparatory work had been taking place had taken place before the war. In terms of training the cadres and preparing the party for the revolution that was to, that was coming. And as Lenin points out in left wing communism. The Bolshevik party was built over decades. In political struggle between opportunism and ultra-leftism. Or rather against opportunism and ultra-leftism. It faced periods of reaction and oppression. <coughs> and it faced periods of open parliamentary work. <coughs> so the leadership in the rest of Europe was not prepared. Uh, and the temporary postponement of the revolution in Europe made the civil war that then took place in Russia possible. You have the 21 armies of intervention that attacked Russia in the period 1919 to 1921. The Bolsheviks won the war, but at a terrible cost. The proletariat in the advanced countries was strong enough to uh, prevent the continued imperialist intervention. All the imperialist armies faced mutinies, mass mutinies. Forcing them to withdraw their troops from Russia in order to prevent them from being infected. And, and that is infected with the spirit of revolution. Because the Bolsheviks didn't fight a war in a conventional way. It was obviously fought with arms and soldiers, but primarily by propaganda, leaflets, and transitional demands. And the work of state survived in a very weakened state.
industry was completely crippled. The iron production was around 2% of what it had been in 1913. Coal was around 17% of what it had been. 17% coal. Oil had survived relatively intact. Had survived relatively intact. Hadn't been oil, so. It was only down to 41% of its pre war level. Manufactured products were down to its 13 to 13 percent of its pre-war level. And also, agriculture had been reduced with 16 percent. 16 percent. Now, obviously, uh, the reduction in agriculture was less. But obviously, the, uh, this reduction meant starvation. Um, 1921 harvest was. Uh, 1921 harvest was actually 43% of the pre-war level. 43%. The working class has been decimated. The number of uh, industrial workers were less than half of what they had been. The population of Petrograd had gone from 2.4 million to 0 0.6 million. But it, even the numerical figures don't tell the full story. Uh, the wor advanced workers that had carried out the revolution in 1917 had been uh, uh, all gone to the front to fight for the revolution. All been uh, sucked into the state apparatus. <laughs> And what remained in the factories were the backward layers that had replaced them. In 1921, I think it was, Lenin explained, the industrial proletariat, owing to the war and to the desperate poverty and ruin, has become declassed and ceased to exist as a proletariat. So, in effect, the Bolsheviks were left with a worker state without the working class to base it on. Um, and uh, what uh, Engels called in, uh, the uh, struggle for individual existence. That is the struggle for you to meet your everyday uh, requirements. Like food, housing, clothes, etc.
Now Engels posed as a condition for the establishment of a healthy socialist regime. And the beginning of the withering away of the state. He posed that this struggle for individual existence has to cease before that can take place. But that is quite obvious, actually, the, the struggle for individual existence had taken on a much more ferocious character in these years. And the worker state were faced, was uh, forced to defend inequality. <coughs> because you couldn't have a situation where everyone was paid the same. Because that meant everyone would be starving. So uh, work, skilled workers were paid a higher wage. And also certain specialists. And the lowest wage of all were given to the peasants. It, uh, the state acquired a dual character. On the one hand, you had nationalized property relations. But on the other hand, the state defended bourgeois norms of distribution. <coughs> it's wage labor continued. Wage labor continued. And on the conditions of very large inequality. Now, under these co uh, conditions, uh, the rise of bureaucracy was inevitable. Uh, during the Civil War, the number of uh, state bureaucrats rose from 100,000 to 5,900,000. So, which meant that they numbered around five times as many as the industrial workers. A number of old state, sorry, state officials and Tsarist officers were incorporated into the state. Because there were not enough educated workers to fill their places. Now, Lenin had a program to um, uh, defend the healthy worker state against bureaucracy. <coughs> The four points. The election of all officials. The right to recall. And officials only to receive the wage of a skilled worker. And finally, the sharing out of tasks and the rotation of tasks. So that all, uh, everyone would be take part in the running of the state. The final point being introduced gradually. But under the conditions of Russia at the time, this became an impossibility. Wage differentials were very high. Uh, there were two between two to one, and under the NEP, they reached five to one. I.e., the highest pay got five times what the lowest pay got.
This is incidentally what the head of the Swedish trade unions uh, I think it's a he now, isn't it? Stefan? Yes. It's a he now. He gets exactly five times the average wage of a worker. Which just goes to show that the norms of wage differentials in Russia at this time were the same as other capitalism. Because of the uh, economic conditions and the need to recover the to have a recovery in the economy, they were forced to extend the working day. So if you're working at a machine for 10 or 12 hours, six, six days a week, you're not going to have a lot of time to participate in the democratic running of society. Or the taking over of the administrative tasks. Uh, the party set up an anti-bureaucracy committee which was uh, in order to prevent the flooding of the party by bureaucrats. Now, uh, Stalin was put in charge of his committee. And ironically, he used it to strengthen the bureaucracy within the party. By appointing to all major positions his own henchmen. In 1921, uh, the Bolshevik party was forced to beat the retreat. And the new economic policy was introduced. Which basically meant restoring uh, market economy and capitalist relations in all smaller enterprises and in the countryside. So you had uh, the attempt of a state to plan just by having control of the commanding heights of the economy, the very tops of the economy. And it had the effect of uh, improving conditions. In particular, agricultural production uh, recovered. But it was like um, a co uh, um, but it was it got out of control. Uh, Lenin said that the machine refused to obey the hand that guided it. The machine refused to obey the hand that guided it. He compared it to the, a, a car that whenever the driver turned to the left, the car would turn to the right. He was uh, pointing out that the, 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 work, the Communist Party was not in control of the situation. Now, I think this was already 1922 or 23. It also had the effect of strengthening the bureaucracy. And it became increasingly confident. <laughs> And Stalin emerged as its figurehead. Yes. 
and uh, Stalin is a bit of a um, accidental character in one way. Stalin is for the he obviously never intended to introduce the kind of regime that he wound up introducing. But his personal characteristics fitted well with the needs of the bureaucracy. Lenin and Trotsky became increasingly worried about uh, how he was rising in the ranks. They were worried about the methods that he was using, as well as his increasing personal rudeness and arrogance. In particular, the, the particular worrying affair was that of uh, uh, Georgia, <laughs> where he uh, bureaucratically overruled the local party. <laughs> to force him to accept uh, his uh, uh, opinions. <laughs> But Lenin, in this period, proposed a whole number of alliances with Trotsky. In order to try to fight the strength of the growing capitalism in Russia. On questions like the monopoly of foreign trade. But also the rising bureaucracy, particularly in the affair around Georgia that I just mentioned. Uh, but Lenin was ill and died quite soon after. And this opened up a whole period of struggle over the leadership. <coughs> Sinoviev and Kamenev originally aligned themselves with Stalin. And here a personal ambition played a role. Particularly Sinoviev saw himself as the inheritor of Lenin. And saw himself as the logical successor. And neither Sinoviev nor Kamenev really understood what was going on. They thought they were using Stalin, but in reality he was using them. <laughs> Now, um, uh, a number of measures were introduced. Uh, in particular, they opened up the party and uh, let in a whole, uh, a couple of million members. Uh, they were largely, largely drawn from the ranks of the <coughs> rising bureaucracy. <laughs> and ironically they call this the Levin, Lenin Levy. <laughs> Now it's one thing to open up the party to a in massive influx of uh, members. In a period of revolutionary upsurge. So in 1917 for example, when the Bolshevik party grew, 
from around 8,000 to 117,000 or something like that. Where revolutionary workers and youth would stream into the party. In order to carry out the revolution. But in this period, you have a completely different phenomenon. The flood would not be workers and youth that are revolution, enthusiastic about the revolution. But petty bureaucrats and uh, budding capitalists who are trying to uh, gain advancement in the state. Now at the same time the revolution suffered another blow in Germany. This was the second wave of the German revolution you could say. And uh, once again Sinovia played a role. Uh, the workers had a chance to seize power in 1923. But the leadership was in a disarray. It takes uh, really to train up a leadership of a, a revolutionary party. It's a process that takes years, if not decades. But well, Sinovich's policy was quite different. Whenever the leadership in Germany made a mistake, he replaced them. And the party leadership was all the week after the uh, murder of Luxembourg and Liebknecht. What he produced was not was not revolutionary cadres, but rather yes men who just said yes to whatever orders came from above. So when this new wave came along, Brandler, who was the leader of the party, he went to Moscow for advice. And he met Sinoviev and Stalin, who urged him to be cautious. And Stalin even said, let the fascists try first. Um, so the revolutionary moment came and then passed. And uh, this was a tremendous blow to the confidence of the uh, workers in, um, well, in Germany, first of all, but also in Russia. Um, now, Trotsky wrote a book criticizing the uh, handling of the affair. It's called uh, Lessons of October, you might have seen it. And he explained the importance of leadership and the importance of being able to judge the moment on which to plan uh, the insurrection. He, he doesn't mention Sinovia by name, but obviously it was obvious to everyone who he was talking about. So Sinovia, rather than accepting the criticism, which was a correct criticism, uh, 
He launched a campaign together with Kamenev and Stalin. Against so called Trotskyism. He later was to admit that this was a complete invention. Which was true. There's no difference between Trotskyism and Leninism. Or Leninism and Marxism, for that matter. But to try to drive a wedge between Lenin and Trotsky it was completely confusing to the Russian workers. Who so quite understandably couldn't really see the difference. And obviously had a demoralizing effect on them. And it, he, they also prepared the way for Stalin in this way. But it was just a simple way for them to save face, to cover their own mistakes. Now, the problem with Kamenev and Sinoviev was that they had some principles. Unlike the third member of the Troika. <laughs> so when Stalin launched the idea of socialism in one country, Sinoviev and Kamenev reacted. Um, now, the whole idea of socialism in one country was, as I said, completely alien to anything that Marx, Engels or Lenin ever had said or thought. But it represented a narrow parochial mentality of the bureaucracy. The uh, increasing power of the so-called net man was making itself felt. The net men were making more noises. And it was a kind of petty trader, speculators, merchants that had, that had grown up during the period of the nap. And also the kulaks, who were kind of capitalist farmers, were making more noise. And they were demanding more uh, concessions in the move towards capitalism. They were putting pressure on the party, which turned which was reflected in the right wing of the party. In particular, Bukharin, he launched the slogan, Get Rich, saying that the peasants could grow themselves into socialism by getting rich. Now, it was under the pressure and the reaction of the working class that Sinovia and Kamenev moved to, uh, over to Trotsky. And the left opposition demanded four year, uh, five year plans. A program of industrialization. A program of voluntary collectivization, as, as well as a restoration of workers' democracy. On the 10th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, they carried placards or banners 
strike against the ne the kulaks, nepmen, and the bureaucrats. <laughs> and uh, obviously the, the other demands I just mentioned. And they received the massive support among the workers. But Trotsky understood that this was, uh, uh, it wasn't enough. For although the workers agreed with uh, the points of the left opposition, they were exhausted and couldn't take action. And it convinced the bureaucracy to move against the left opposition. And Trotsky pointed out that the criticism that uh, the left opposition made and the pressure that they uh, brought to bear on the bureaucracy saved the worker state from capitalist restoration. But, but without the intervention of the world revolution, there was, there was no way it could actually defeat the bureaucracy. Now, uh, in 1927-28, the regime reached a new crisis. Where the agricultural production was lead, the increase in agricultural production was leading to a drop in agricultural prices. And the production of industrial industrial products couldn't keep up. So the um, uh, peasants hoarded all the uh, agricultural products, as well as the uh, kulaks and the nepmen, hoping for an increase in um, uh, agricultural prices. And this forced the hand, well, they were demanding as well a rapid movement towards capitalism. Although obviously they didn't use those words. So, in order to prevent the complete uh, collapse of the regime, Stalin now did a 180 degree turn. So he now struck against the right wing, Bukharin, etc. He implemented the program of the left opposition, but in a bureaucratic way. He launched the slogan, liquidation of the Kulaks as a class. Which meant a massive program of forced collectivization. Not just of the Kulaks, of the rich peasants. But also of all the impoverished peasants. In 1929, about 1.7% of all farms were collective. Two years later, it was 53%. And in 1939, it was 90%. And in 1939, the effect of this was disastrous. By 1932, agricultural production had halved. Rather than uh, handing the cattle over to the collective farms, 
The peasants slaughtered their animals and ate them. And so the stock of pigs and cattle and so on was completely decimated. And in fact, it was less than half the number of animals that remained. It was like a civil war in the countryside, with uh, army battalions trying to seek out cattle before the peasants uh, slaughtered it. Seven million people starved to death in this period. They starved to death. At the same time, uh, uh, the, uh, there was a program of industrialization. Now, it was massively, the uh, result of this was massively successful. Most uh, uh, primary uh, industrial products like coal and iron and so on. Doubled in a period of four years. And the overall growth rate was something in the region of 20% in industry. This was kept up until the late 30s when they slowed the pace a bit. But it was carried out on the back of the working class. One man management was introduced. And party branches were banned from interfering in the, in, in the decisions of management. Absenteeism from work. Of as little as 20 minutes. Was, was to be punished with sacking and eviction from factory housing. The working week, the working week was lengthened and Sunday was abolished as a day of rest. And in the early period, resources that were previously dedicated to consumption were moved towards heavy industry. So Stalinism meant complete obliteration of all the rights of a working class. And with the pace of industrialization, the bureaucracy gained in confidence. The party, uh, party officials had previously been banned from uh, receiving the higher range of wages. And were only supposed to receive that of a skilled worker. But now that uh, uh, that uh, rule was abolished, and the bureaucracy uh, were free to enjoy the full privileges.
Um, at the same time, you have the disastrous policy of, uh, of the third period. In the Communist International, which leads to the rise of Hitler. Where the uh, communist workers of Germany are instructed to fight the social democratic workers of Germany. Because the social democrats were really social fascists. Um, but th th there was still a revolutionary period in the mid 1930s in France and Spain and so on. And the bureaucracy did not feel firmly in its seat. So, uh, a campaign to uh, completely eliminate all traces of the revolution was begun. And Trotsky calls this a one-sided civil war against the Bolshevik party. The starting shot was a congress in 1934, where Kirov received more votes for the Central Committee than Stalin did. Now, uh, the uh, votes, the committee that counted the votes, uh, they had to, uh, they were originally going to uh, give the results. Yeah. But uh, they were sent back and had to do a recount. And when they recounted the ballot papers, they obviously found that Stalin had gotten the most votes. Kirov was assassinated at the end of 1934. And by 1939, 90% of the delegates to that Congress were dead or had disappeared. And it wasn't just the party members, but also their families, their friends, anyone around them. Um, the, the, out of the CC of 1917, uh, only two people survived until 1940. It wasn't just the Trotskyists and left opposition, but then Bukharin and the right opposition, and then Stalin's own supporters in the party. The Red Army was completely decimated, particularly those who had served in Spain in one form or another. 20 to 30,000 officers were killed. Um, 90 percent of generals, 80 percent of colonels, etc. Um, now, Stalin attempted to reach an alliance with the West. After getting worried about the rise of Hitler. But the West didn't want any alliance with Stalin. They didn't want an alliance with Stalin. Uh, and so, um, 
a bit, their whole perspective was that Hitler and Stalin would fight it out and then they could come in and sweep up. When the two were in the weakened state. So um, Hitler and Stalin signed the pact instead. Which completely confused the communist movement around the world. Because it wasn't just that they uh, signed an agreement not to attack Hitler, like a non-aggression pact. But they also saw so delusions in what Hitler was. Uh, and, and to some extent, they, uh, the Stalinist clique even deluded themselves. Uh, they handed over communists and Jews to the Gestapo. They destroyed fortifications in the West. And they exported vast amounts of raw materials to Germany as late as in 1940. And it was obvious that Hitler was planning to uh, attack Russia. The Soviet Union, thanks to a lot of loyal communists in Europe, had, had a vast spy network who were constantly feeding them reports about Hitler's war plans. But uh, they were completely ignored. When Hitler attacked, it took them 48 hours to start to mobilize the resistance. Tanks and planes were caught on the ground without their crews. And millions of soldiers were encircled and taken prisoner. By the end of 1941, the Soviet, Soviet Union had lost 60% of its raw material production. But still, the gains of a planned economy made it possible for them to mobilize the defense. They released a few of the generals that had been imprisoned in the previous period. And they started training a new generation of officers. They moved whole industries from the west to the east. And built them up beyond the Urals, far away from Hitler's advance. And they may, managed to uh, start producing and even outproduce the Germans. Uh, they started winning some military victories. First one being in Stalingrad. And the second important one being in Kursk. The Allies gave them no help whatsoever. They were keeping, the English were keeping uh, behind the English Channel. And, 
and only we were only fighting in Africa. Only once the Red Army was we had started advancing across the whole of Europe, or East Europe. Only at that point did they open up a second front in the West. Now the Second World War, we all know how it ended. But just like the se uh, with the victory of the Allies, but um, it also ended with a revolutionary wave. Just like the First World War had. Um, but the Stalinist bureaucracy obviously had no interest in the revolution. They feared the effect they would have inside Russia. They feared that the mobilized working class in the revolution in the West could provoke a uh, revolution in the East. That would depose the bureaucracy of its privileges. So when they advanced in Eastern Europe, they made sure that every revolution a revolutionary movement was defeated. So, for example, the rising in Warsaw preceded the uh, arrival of the Red Army. But when the Red Army reached Warsaw, it stopped. It stopped. It's outside the uh, wall, or out with, uh, within some distance of Warsaw. In the meantime, the SS and the uh, German army crushed the revolutionary uprising in Warsaw. And only then would the Red Army advance and uh, take the city. The uh, Stalin made an agreement with Churchill about how to divide up Europe. Uh, Greece and Italy, for example, were handed over to the Allies. And the uh, courageous partisans that fought against uh, Nazi occupation were betrayed. Stalin told a uh, Yugoslav communist that the uprising in Greece must be stopped and as quickly as possible. Churchill was very impressed with Stalin because when the English were fighting uh, the partisans in Athens there was not a word of criticism in the Russian press the only reason why the Yugoslavia went the way it did because Stalin favored the restoration of the monarchy was that the partisans literally took control of the country and threw out the Germans. Before the Red Army or the imperialists could get there. But um, still, the uh, the bureaucracy carried out the revolution in Eastern Europe, but in a bureaucratic, deformed way. <laughs> <laughs>
Eh, no obstante, la argumentación sí que llevó a cabo la recomendación en el cuerpo de este que no ha formado nada. And capitalism was abolished in the whole of Eastern Europe. And uh, no thanks to Stalin. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Chinese communists took power in China. And the victory of the Red Army and uh, the spreading of Socialism gave the Russian bureaucracy a whole new air of authority. After the Chinese Revolution, probably about a third of the um, world surface. Was, was covered by deformed worker states. And uh, the productive forces were being developed. In China as well as in uh, the Soviet Union. And in Eastern Europe. So the prestige of the bureaucracy was great. And they used this to even further increase their privileges. Wage differentials became massive. In a single uh, workplace, you can have a differential uh, whereby someone would earn 13 times the lowest paid worker. Or even 20 times. If you counted all the bureaucratic privileges, special hospitals, special shops, etc. It is estimated that wage differentials could be as much as 1 to 100. Now this would make uh, Western capitalist managers pale with envy. They're usually happy with a 1 to 10 ratio or something like that. <laughs> but the Bonapartist regime, which this was, a constantly fraught with crisis. A constant regime of constant crisis. And Stalin's paranoia was growing with every year. And in 1953, he pre prepared a new wave of purges. In, in Pravda, they published uh, an article about the so called doctor's plot. <laughs> where a Jewish uh, imperialist organization conspired to kill all the leading uh, communist party officials. So pogroms were being prepared, anti-Jewish uh, attacks. And another great purge of the bureaucracy. But then, uh, everyone ha had a sigh of relief. Because Stalin mysteriously died. Um, and this prevented this another wave of purges from taking place. After the Stalin's death, the regime tried to open up a bit. 
dopo la morte del Stalin, they tried to encourage to let the you know let up let off a bit of state. By encouraging uh, criticism and so on. Khrushchev had his secret speech. In 1956, in which he tried to blame Stalin for everything that had taken place over the last 20 years. But obviously Stalin, as an individual, could not have taken, done all of this, uh, created all of this mess that we're in. Khrushchev, even in this speech, mentions the complete mess that the first part of World War II was. But he obviously blames everything on Stalin. But the new gang of gangsters that were ahead of the Soviet Union had all been taking part in the purges and were important the henchmen during the purges. So it was complete hypocrisy. Now, uh, the, um, uh, the opening up uh, provoked a wave of uh, unrest in the whole of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. <coughs> Because the working class saw it as an opportunity to strike a blow against the bureaucracy. <coughs> I don't have time to deal with it, but you have the events in Hungary and in Poland and Czechoslovakia in this period. <coughs> And the regime was in quite a perilous state, it was quite a dangerous situation for it. In order to crush the, uh, in, uh, the movement, they had to draft in backward peasant troops from far away places. And who were sent to Hungary to defeat the fascist uprising. After the first wave of troops they had sent had completely fraternized with the workers and uh, had to be pulled out again. Now the regime was losing steam, it was losing its uh, momentum. In the 1950s they had a rate of growth of around 10%. But by the 1960s it was declining uh, to around uh, below 8%. Now the modern, the modern economy uh, amplified the problems of the bureaucracy. The economy of the 1930s had been relatively simple, a relatively limited number of uh, goods, a relatively li limited number of raw materials, with the beginning of electronics and the new uh, type of electrical equipment that emerged in this period. It complicated the whole process of planning. 
and without and without the without the oxygen of workers' control, the whole e e economy was gradually grinding to a halt. There was uh, corruption, mismanagement. On a scale previously unseen. Uh, agriculture was in a really bad state. It never had recovered from the uh, 1930s. And uh, it's, uh, there was no growth at all in agriculture. As late as in 1982, one worker in the Soviet Union, an agricultural worker in the Soviet Union, could only feed six workers in the cities. In the United States, on the other hand, one worker could feed 40 workers in the cities. Um, agricultural machinery was a particular problem. Between 1966 and 1970, uh, they produced 1.5 million tractors in the Soviet Union. But they had to retire 1.1 million. So almost every tractor that they produced was simply replacing a broken down tractor. Uh, in, they produced a half a million uh, half combine harvesters. Half a million, one half. But they replaced, but um, 350,000 were simply replacing broken down ones. Now, the uh, stagnation in the economy pro provoked a crisis in the leadership. Uh, Brezhnev had replaced Khrushchev in the 1960s. And he, he signaled a return to a kind of repressive era. Then followed two leaders who haven't made any name for themselves in history. Because they were so old that they died almost immediately after being elected or chosen. Uh, Chernenko replaced Brezhnev. And Andropov replaced Chernenko. Now, Andropov came from the KGB, which ironically meant that he was more susceptible from the pressure that was building up among the masses. Because the secret Secret Service was more in tune with what was taking place in society. 
He had a he had a protege who was called Gorbachev. And finally, the regime kind of settled on him in the early 80s, mid 80s. Now, in order to kind of ease up the bureaucratic stagnation, to let up the to get the wheels moving again. Uh, Gorbachev attempted to lean on the workers to strike a blow against sections of the bureaucracy. Uh, whilst at the same time defending the bureaucratic system as a whole. I think we're going to try to spend about 10 minutes on post break and then I'm finished. Maybe 15. Uh, now he attacked the bureaucracy in spe speeches. And he tried to introduce elements of democracy at the lowest level. Uh, democracy was like the right to elect your, the lowest layer of managers were introduced. And they encouraged reports of mismanagement, corruption and so on in the press and elsewhere. But also this, obviously this was limited to a very small scale. The changes were merely cosmetic. It was very little action and a lot of words. Around 200,000 officials were sacked. But at this stage, the bureaucracy probably numbered something like 19 million people. Um, and, uh, uh, and originally the reforms had some success. And they achieved around 4% growth in the first couple of years. But the, uh, it's, they gradually petered out the growth, slowed down again. And the economy was beginning to grind to halt completely. <laughs> so although Gorbachev was uh, making a lot of speeches about democracy and so on, <laughs> democratic socialism, all these kind of words, <laughs> the first thing that would be on the agenda if the workers were to have a say would be the question of bureaucratic privileges. But although in the past, in the 1920s and 30s, there might be a, a, a case for having quite substantial differences in wages. In order, in order to maintain a layer of intellectuals, administrators and so on, with better living conditions. And also layer of skilled workers. <coughs> By the time you reach the 1980s, all of this is, there's no justification for this anymore. We're no longer dealing with an overwhelmingly peasant society, but it's actually an advanced industrial society. <laughs> Thank you.
was something like 60% of the workforce uh, was workers in industry. Uh, but the whole regime was now collapsing. The youth had, was particularly dissatisfied with the regime. Opinion polls were published in Pravda, where 14% of youth said they trusted the Communist Party. And only around 15 to 20 percent said they believed in socialism. There were a lot of cynical jokes that spread. And one is particularly telling, I think. He said, have we reached real communism yet? Or is there worse yet to come? Yeah. Um, right, distribution uh, of products were collapsing. Uh, the products were rotting in the warehouses. The black market was growing rapidly. In the last four years of the 1980s, Around 13,000 products disappeared from the shelves of the shops. And the, uh, the nascent, the early stages of the bourgeoisie was developing. And Yeltsin became its main proponent. He made a name for himself as a very uh, uh, fervent believer in perestroika. Uh, he made demagogic attacks against the privileges of the bureaucracy. He demanded uh, uh, investigations of corruption in so Soviet republics. Particularly some, there were some particularly blatant cases in the Caucasus which he attacked. He tried to present himself as a man of the people. So whereas all the so as all the other leaders would go around in chauffeur-driven cars, he used public transport instead. Uh, the uh, opening up that Gorbachev was encouraging were causing a collapse of uh, e uh, the regimes in Eastern Europe very rapidly. And in this situation you had elements of political revolution. For example, for example the movement of the Solidarność workers in Poland. But of all these movements, the leadership was either too weak or consciously betrayed the movement in order to turn it towards capitalism. The imperialists 
uh, uh, allied themselves with Yeltsin, his faction. Uh, giving him compliments and support, offering him, uh, offering aid to him, etc. Uh, Gorbachev attempted to balance between the right wing and the conservative faction. And Yeltsin became head uh, or president of the Russian Federation, so below the, the Soviet Union, then underneath Russian Federation. And he embarked on a rapid uh, program of privatizations. Now, for several years, then continued the struggle between the sort of conservative elements and the pro-capitalist wing. Now, in one sense, the restoration of capitalism wasn't a foregone conclusion. It wasn't determined from the beginning. But the kind of uh, conservative elements who wanted to keep the planned economy, they, uh, they refused to base themselves on the working class and mobilize them against the uh, pro-capitalist wing. So, so there was a botched military coup which only, last, which only lasted for about 24 hours. Which provided Yeltsin with an excellent opportunity to, lose, to uh, present himself as the Democrat. But this was a complete uh, lie. In fact, Yeltsin was striving with the support of imperialism to get as many, gather as much power as possible into his own hands. Uh, and Yeltsin attempted to forcibly dissolve the parliament. And he uh, gathered troops to, tr uh, to try to take over and occupy the parliament. Yeah. Which led to a big siege of uh, parliamentary building. But once again, the... the um, the uh, sort of uh, conservative wing refused to lean on the working class. And gradually, little uh, step by step, the right wing managed to win. Uh, and obviously, with every reform, with every privatization, they create a priv another, a new strength for the capitalist class. But, but all, they also increase the centrifugal tendencies in the whole of the Soviet Union. So one after another, the old Soviet republics uh, left the Soviet Union. Which further deepened the economic collapse. And uh, the massive waves of privatization. Was supposed to be combined with uh, foreign investment. That the West promised. But nothing came. 
And so as the gangsters at the top uh, got hold of more and more of the wealth of Russia, and you have the phenomena of these oligarchs who uh, are tremendously wealthy people. Who by uh, cheating and uh, lying and dealing with bureaucracy. Managed to grab hold of the key industries and the natural resources of Russia. You can actually, some of it has been exposed recently in a court trial in London. Because of a completely informal way in which they got hold of these industries. The bribery, the corruption, etc. To this day, they can't quite decide what industry belongs to whom. I got some feedback. I got some figures for the collapse in the economy and so on that followed. Uh, I'll try to give that and also some of what happened with Putin, but I'll do deal with that in summing up.